And um, so this system is um, uh, one of the earliest, actually beginning in the 1970s, that um, was approached by um, a mathematical analysis. Let's see, the slides are not advancing. Sorry. Um, okay. Uh, approached by a mathematical analysis uh, based on um, physical processes. And in this case, um, the reaction diffusion mechanism that was um, pioneered by Alan Turing that I spoke about in my talk yesterday. And um, the, um, when the Turing idea for the limb was first proposed, it was actually confronting um, uh, an older view that was characteristic of the way development was looked at in the um, 1960s and 70s. And it was more of a cybernetic approach. So let, let's consider these two approaches. Um, so this is a limb bud um, from a vertebrate organism like a mouse or like uh, a human. And um, the we have to try to understand how um, the fingers, for example, will form within this tissue because the tissue is quite homogeneous looking to begin with. And the um, earlier approach, the more cybernetic approach, said that every cell is like a little computer program. Its genome uh, is a, a program. It has um, a representation of all the parts of the body in it. And all that's needed is some kind of a gradient shown by this shaded region here. And the cells read the gradient and they make fingers of different types, um, digits. And um, these um, are because there is a kind of internal representation in the cells and all they need is this positional information um, in the tissue. And they just read the positional information and they make the different digits. This is the, the outcome, a stained preparation. The, um, the more um, physically oriented approach um, that was um, proposed in the um, late 70s said that um, there's a physical process that creates these um, chemical waves, um, these uh, non-uniform peaks and valleys of, of some um, molecule. And here you see the, um, all the fingers when they first emerge are the same as each other. They may be slightly different sizes, but it's the same thing because uh, you have a wave-like process that just um, activates the tissue in different places. And then um, later on, these can become kind of customized like cars coming off an assembly line that are all identical to begin with, but then they become uh, customized. Um, so um, the key difference here is that um, here the cells are reacting on the basis of some internal program, but here you have interacting signals that organize the tissue in this repeated fashion and that the um, differences only appear later on, and then you get the same outcome. So this is the kind of physical, genetic, or, or generic approach. And this is a, a more programmatic, cybernetic approach. And uh, I'm going to show you that this is the, um, the view that actually has um, prevailed and is, is widely accepted now. But um, it took a long time for it to set in because um, this uh, idea was very popular uh, for many systems and actually systems like segmentation and gastrulation um, gave way to the more physical approach way before the limb did. The limb was kind of the last to succumb to this uh, physical genetic approach. Okay, so just um, some definitions to begin with. This is a chicken limb during development and it's shown transparent and you can see the bones uh, become established close to the body first. And then as time goes on, different stages, you get the entire skeleton laid out. And the entire skeleton is cartilage first. So the process in this tissue 
is called chondrogenesis, the development of cartilage. And it happens in um, what's called a proximal distal order. Proximal is the part close to the body and distal is furthest from the body. And here, these axes are shown on a human hand, um, just more familiar to us. So proximal is the part that's close to the attachment point of the body and distal is out to the fingertips. Um, anterior is the thumb end of the limb and posterior is the little finger end. So there's a anteroposterior axis and dorsal is the back of the hand and um, ventral is the front. So there are three axes that are kind of landmarks for understanding development. And when we go back here and we can see there is a proximal distal progression of the laying out of the elements. Okay. Now, an important thing that happens before cartilage even differentiates is that the tissue inside the limb, it's called mesenchymal tissue, and you have these cells that are scattered and they're embedded in a jelly-like material called the extracellular matrix. And when the cartilage region is going to form, and I'll go back and show you, when um, the cartilage first begins to form, um, it begins as this light gray trace here, and that is a condensation. These are condensations, meaning that the cells in this tissue move together and clump. And that is the first sign that cartilage will form there. And we can see that that happens um, progressively over time. And it happens because there is some additional material shown in this brown shading here that appears just in those sites where you're going to get condensations forming. When the condensations form, the cells signal to each other and they differentiate into cartilage. Later on in most species, the cartilage gets replaced by bone. So the first patterning process is this um, condensation process. Okay, now um, one of the ways that we study these mechanisms are particularly using um, chicken or mouse tissues is that we um, isolate from uh, a limb bud, like a five day limb bud, we isolate a piece of tissue that has not yet formed any cartilage or even formed any condensations. We disperse the cells and we put them in culture. And this is about three millimeters across here. And um, the dimensions of the limb are, this is um, a, a total of about um, uh, five, seven millimeters in diameter. So this culture represents, um, um, it, it's, a, it's a blown up version of this, but the culture forms many little nodules. Uh, and the, these nodules are condensed cells. So the cells between them are also mesenchyme. They're, then they're not seen here because they're not forming these dense nodules. But anyway, we study this nodule formation in culture and it shows patterns that are on the same spatial scale as the patterns that we see in the limb. Actually, um, this is much smaller than, than this. This is uh, really less than a millimeter here. So each of these little digits is about the same scale as one of those nodules. This is really about um, uh, a half a millimeter. Okay, so the basis of the um, Turing type of mechanism, this um, physical mechanism of patterning, um, is that um, there are activator and inhibitor interactions. Or this is one of the, um, the forms that the Turing mechanism can take. So you have cells here and the cells are producing an activator. And the activator is a self, um, a, a, a autocatalytic or um, 
um, positively autoregulatory activator. So when the cells produce it, uh, it reflects back on the cells and causes it to produce even more. And then the cells condense in response to this activator. And um, what happens is that eventually, because it's an explosive autoactivation, the whole tissue mass will organize into a big nodule of cartilage. But if at the same time, um, the activator induces the production of an inhibitory molecule and the inhibitory molecule diffuses away um, faster than the activator does, then you get this repeating pattern where um, you have centers of activation, condensation, chondrogenesis separated by spaces that are inhibited from undergoing this process. So when you have these two components, this was the inside of Turing. When you have these two components, um, you wind up with um, a, an inherently pattern forming mechanism. They have to be balanced in an appropriate way um, for to get you to get the pattern. But once they're in balance, you get this kind of pattern. Okay, so is there any evidence for anything like this? Well, um, we looked at this um, using probes against um, proteins that are called galactins. And this work was uh, done by Ramray Bhatt, who's um, here at the meeting uh, when he was a graduate student with me. And just about everything I'm going to be speaking about from now on um, was um, uh, participated in and, and led in many ways by uh, Ram Ray Bhatt uh, with uh, some other colleagues of ours. Um, and um, what Ram Ray found was that um, there, there were a set of galactins um, that were had been found in the chicken ge genome. And the, and the chicken genome specifies um, five different galactins and um, two of them play a key role in this um, Turing type of process. And um, so the galactins can be separated into a number of categories and they're called galactins. You may be familiar with the term lectins, which are plant proteins that bind to carbohydrates. And these are basically animal lectins or endogenous lectins of animal tissues, and they also bind carbohydrate ligands. Um, and the, um, the ligands that they bind on the cell surface always end in a galactoside, a beta galactoside. So they have um, binding sites for the beta galactoside shown as these um, um, scooped out areas here. And they have a number of different formats. And um, in mammals, there are a dozen or more galactins, and they're all enumerated over here. Um, primates have more than um, rodents, but um, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, birds have very few galactins. Um, they, they have the fewest among all of the uh, vertebrate classes. And um, uh, the, the ones that are in boxes are um, bird galactins, chicken galactins, just galactin one, galactin 2, galactin 3, and galactin 8. And they have different uh, arrangements. This is um, two different proteins that are attached to each other. Here's one protein that's attached to a non-galactin tail. And here are two galactins that form an, a, um, a dimer, a non-covalently attached dimer. But in fact, in birds and in reptiles, the uh, seropsids, galactin 1 is duplicated. And this is not the case in mammals. Um, it, it's the case in, um, in fish and amphibians. You have several galactin 1s. But in mammals, you only have one galactin 1. In seropsids, you have two galactin 1s. They're called galactin 1A and galactin 1B. And what we found was that um, if we looked at the development of the limb, either in 
um, situ and, and the actual limb bud, or um, if we looked at the progress of chondrogenesis and culture, Galactin 1A was highly expressed just at the time the condensations were forming. And here is, um, uh, is RNA staining, uh, staining of the RNA for the um, galactins in the condensation region. And um, it happens just at the time that condensation is taking place. And similarly with galactin 8, there is an upregulation during condensation. And um, here we're looking at um, uh, two days, three days, six days um, during chondrogenesis in culture. And this is um, a lower magnification than this, but you see these nodular sites. And the galactin 1A and the galactin 8 um, coincide in their staining, and they stain at both the uh, RNA and protein levels, they stain the condensations. Galactin 1B, 2, and 3 are expressed to much lower or negligible extents during this period. Okay, now doing um, a whole bunch of experiments that involved um, knocking down these galactins with um, um, inhibitory RNAs or overexpressing the galactins by injecting messenger RNA or um, using other methods of blocking or enhancing, we found that um, the phenotype that we got, and this is a, a, a stained limb, and you see the skeletal structures. This is a normal limb. This is the humerus, the radius, ulna, here are the digits. This is the control. If we add galactin 8 to the tip of the limb, we're missing structures. But if we um, knock down galactin 8, we get extra structures, ectopic structures that are not usually part of the, the limb. Similarly, if we add galactin 1, it's collecting 1A in this case, we get extra structures, but if we knock down collecting one, we get fewer structures. So they have opposing phenotypic effects. And we found that they have reciprocal effects on each other. So um, CG1A addition phenotype is opposite to the CG1A inhibition phenotype, but it's similar to the CG8 inhibition phenotype, which in turn is opposite to the CG8 addition phenotype. And we looked at um, numbers of condensations, amount of intercondensation spacing um, in, in all these cases, and um, all, all, all of these um, effects were reciprocal. Okay, but we also found that galactin 1A and galactin 8 activate each other's gene expression, despite having opposite effects on skeletogenesis. So what does that mean? So we're looking here at um, cells treated with galactin, uh, cells treated with galactin 8, um, and we're looking at expression of galactin 1A, and we get much more galactin 1A when we treat the cells with galactin 8. Here, if we treat the cells with galactin 1A, we get much more galactin 8. So they activate each other's production. So this is a little paradoxical because they have opposite effects on skeletogenesis, but we found that Galactin 1A aggregates limb cells and galactin 8 interferes with it. So we used a, a turbidometric um, method to look at the clumping of cells in the presence of each of these molecules. So if we add galactin 1A or CG1A is another term for it 
um, the cells undergo aggregation. But if we add CG8, it doesn't cause aggregation. Or if we add a portion of CG8 that is um, uh, has the uh, combining region for the um, uh, cell surface ligand, we find that we can inhibit the aggregation um, of induced by CG1A or galactin 1A if we add CG8. And similarly, if we just add it in any step along the way, we can knock down the aggregation. Now, another thing that I, I should point out is that we also um, you could uh, refer to the paper. It's, I'm not going to go into all the details, but we could also look at the effect of these galactins on the cell surface binding component. These are poorly characterized. The only thing that's known about them is that they bind the galactins and you can assay for them by having um, labeled galactins and asking whether the cells pick up the labeled galactins. And we found that CG1A induced its own uh, cell surface ligand, which tended to make it stick to the cells more avidly because it was inducing its own binding um, its own binding modality. CG8 bound the cells very well, but it didn't specifically induce its own binding. Okay, so the, this summary of these experiments can be put in a schematic like this. So this is mesenchymal cell interactions mediated by galactin 1A, galactin 8, and their glycan ligands. And this constitutes a pattern forming network. And just um, based on the experiments, we came up with um, a kind of a very rough idea about what's going on. So the initial condition is that galactin-8 ligand is uniformly distributed. So there's a fluctuation that leads to locally elevated galactin-1A expression. What it does is that it induces its own ligand, which restricts its diffusion. But it also induces the synthesis of galactin-8, and galactin-8 induces the synthesis of galactin-1A, as shown by the experiments that I described before. Galactin-8 is not particularly confined to the place that it's um, it's produced because its ligand is uniformly distributed and it doesn't induce its own ligand. So it diffuses from its site of production, laterally blocking the activity of galactin 1A. Remember, it interferes with the ability of galactin 1A to cause the cells to clump. But then galactin 1A becomes elevated and active at sites distant from the original one. So you basically get a pattern forming by this dynamics. Okay. But just that kind of hand-waving argument is not sufficient to prove that this really goes on. What we did with our colleague Tillman Glim is to um, construct a mathematical model that contained all of the experimental components, uh, all of the uh, uh, terms uh, of interaction that we had experimental data for and um, ter at terms that we knew existed that we eventually found um, experimental parameters for. So um, this is the paper modeling the morphodynamic galactin patterning network in the developing avian limb skeleton. So what does morphodynamic mean? Um, in, in a standard Turing mechanism, you get a chemical pattern, and then the cells undergo a behavior, a differentiation, for example, based on the chemical pattern that, that forms. And you don't need the cells to move in order to get the pattern to form, but the cells might move in response to that pattern. 
So you have a pattern forming and then the cell executes some activity. We call that morphostatic because there's no movement that's intrinsic to the patterning mechanism. And here is the set of integral differential equations that we came up with um, that um, accounted for all of the um, phenomena that we had observed, or at least represented it. So we have a term. So this is the dynamics of cell density, cell density to R. And we have cells being able to diffuse or move, and cells undergo cell-cell adhesion. Okay. And um, there's binding and unbinding of lectins to their ligands or counter receptors. And there's the change in the density of the counter receptors in response to the collectin. Then there's the dynamics of collectin 1A. Uh, and it involves um, the fusion of collecting one way itself, and um, it involves um, the response to collectin eight, the concentration of collectin eight, and then there is um, there are terms that represent the degradation of the collectins, and there's a similar equation for the dynamics of collectin eight that involves collectin 1A. Okay, and what we found is that this system could form patterns and it would form very regular patterns. But take a look at this term over here. This is a cell-cell adhesion term. It's a term that represents the movement of cells in response to collectin 1A, when collectin 1A um, reaches um, a certain threshold concentration. And um, there is a, a parameter that is um, alpha sub K that um, is, is part of this um, it is part of this um, term, and um, that parameter has to be above a certain level. If that that parameter is just 200, and that parameter is is a component of this um, constant k here, and um, if it's 200, you don't get patterns at all. If it's above, if it's 250 or above, you get patterns, and the quality of the patterns is slightly changed by an increase in that parameter. So there's a dependence of patterning on the adhesion term. This is something that you don't see in the standard Turing reaction diffusion mechanism. So we called this system a reaction diffusion adhesion <coughs> mechanism to um, indicate that adhesion is an inherent part of the patterning process. If you don't have <clears throat> a certain amount of adhesion or movement of the cells up the collectin gradient, you don't get a pattern at all. So this system is morphodynamic and not morphostatic. Okay, so then we decided since um, patterns of different um, vertebrate fins and limbs are quite different from each other. Um, we decided to trace back the collectins. Uh, uh, the data was becoming available for different species, for different fish, for cartilaginous fish, for ray finned fish, for um, the, um, the vertebrate organisms with um, the kinds of limbs that we have, um, the proximal distally um, um, uh, developing limbs. This is moving by itself now. And so we, um, with, with our colleague um, Mahul Chakabordi and, um, um, and, and um, uh, Dr. Saira Mian, 
we looked at um, structural divergence um, of the um, galactin ones. And we found, as I mentioned before, chickens, and, and this is a zebra finch, they have uh, a galactin that we call galactin 1b. And we know that that galactin does not induce cell aggregation. It does not induce skeletogenesis, and it does not track the formation of the cartilage elements or the precartilage condensations. So this is a non-skeletogenic galactin. And here it is in, in a certain chromosome, and you can find the homologous chromosomes in turtle, in mouse, in xenophus, and mouse has just one galactin, one, one galactin, one, and it sits on the corresponding chromosomal site of its counterpart chromosome as galactin 1b in these seropsids. And in Xenopus, there are three different galactin ones, and they're all clustered here, again, in a similar chromosomal environment. Okay, so as I said, we know that these are non-skeletogenic. We don't know too much about these, but we can look at the data on their protein sequence, and we can calculate features of their three-dimensional structure in their combining regions in, um, with their um, cell surface ligands, and we can find that... Um, um, Stuart? The, yes? Uh, sorry, Vidya here. You know, we seem to be stuck on that uh, slide which shows the differential equations. The slides haven't moved really? beyond that. Ooh, that's bad. Um, you're not seeing anything now? Any changes? No, the same same slide. Okay. Um, I'm going to um, close this and reopen it. Sorry about that. You must have not known what I was talking about. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> we wondered. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, sorry. Please um, speak up if something doesn't make yes, sense. Yes. Um, do you see something here? No, same slide. Same slide. Okay. Okay. Oh, I see it on the screen, yeah. Okay. Any change now? No. Just give me a moment, I'll share this again, and we'll see if it changed. Um, okay. You've seen these slides? Yes. Okay. Good. Yeah, that's that's the differential okay. equations. Yeah. Okay, and but, now, uh, yeah, no, now we are lost the slides. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so there's this paper title now: structural okay. divergence. That's good. Good. That's what I want to show. Right. Okay, and um, so that's this is the paper that describes the um, phylogeny of galactin one, which is a skeletogenic galactin. Okay, did it move? Yes. Okay. Okay. Here are galactin 1Bs in um, seropsids, in birds and in a turtle. Here's galactin 1 in a mouse. And here are three different galactin 1s in xenophus. Okay. And just to summarize, I'll tell you that we know that this is not skeletogenic. If we dump this onto cells, it doesn't make new condensations. It doesn't, um, and this particular protein does not track condensation formation, precartilage condensation. But if we look at the um, three-dimensional structure of the galactin one in the counterpart position in mouse, this is skeletogenic according to the um, the structure of the combining site 
of, um, of the um, galactin. It resembles galactin 1A, which I told you before was skeletogenic. And among these Xenophus galactin ones, one of them is skeletogenic and the other two are not, but they're all clustered here. Okay, did the slide move? Yes. Okay. Um, so now we're at a different chromosome. And in the case of the seropsids, here's again, chicken, zebra finch, turtle. We have galactin 1As on a completely new chromosome. You can see that the environment, the contigs are similar. And there's nothing in mammals or amphibians or in fish um, in that region. So basically, um, um, th there's been a, a duplication and a jump to a new chromosome. And these are the skeletogenic galactins by um, analysis of the three-dimensional combining structure of the galactins. So the galactin 1A gene is on a different chromosome from the other galactin ones. Okay, and the conclusion of this analysis, and I'm only showing you a little bit of it because it's quite complicated, but the galactin 1A, do you see a word slide now? Yes. Okay, galactin 1 gene underwent duplications and divergent evolution in the amphibians. Um, one of the galactin 1 genes translocated to a new locus at the origin of the seropsids. The seropsids are the birds and reptiles. Its protein product, galactin 1A, retained the 3D structure found in at least one galactin one of all vertebrate species and is skeletogenic in birds. The gene that remained at the ancestral locus in the seropsis, galactin 1b, evolved to specify a non-skeletogenic protein, galactin 1b. Mammals have a single galactin 1 gene. There was no duplication or translocation at the ancestral locus, but its protein structure retains the presumed skeletogenic 3D structure. So what I'm saying is that all of the vertebrates have at least one skeletogenic galactin 1, but in the seropsids it's on a different chromosome than it is in all of the other vertebrates. Okay, now let's think about the mammals where so we know the, that mammals have um, a skeletogenic, a presumed skeletogenic galactin 1. And here is the expression. Uh, this is um, data that's shared with our colleagues, uh, Tom Stewart and Gunter Wagner. And um, here we have um, galactin 1 um, uh, being expressed uh, at high levels. In, um, in the chicken wing and in the chicken leg. And here's the rabbit forelimb and the rabbit hind limb. And galactin 1 is expressed at high levels during limb development as well. But we also found out around this time that if you knock out galactin 1 in, in the mouse, um, the limbs developed develop normally. Is there something different about the mouse? We find that in the mouse forelimb and hind limb, not only is galactin 1 upregulated, but galactin 7, which is a very similar protein to galactin 1, is also upregulated. So there may be a compensation and developmental system drift that allows galactin 7 to take over when galactin 1 is not present. But that's the case in mice, but not the case in rabbits. In rabbits, it's very much the same situation that we have in birds. Okay, in any case, so that's one component. And the bottom line is that um, this skeletogenic protein, the one that induces the condensations, 
uh, is present in all of the um, uh, organisms that have a, a limb skeleton. Okay, we look now at galactin eight, a tandem repeat galactin, and we looked at the phylogenetic history of that. And we found that in um, um, cartilaginous fish, there was, there's a galactin eight. And as there is in all, this is um, ray fin fish, the common fish, um, which has a, an endoskeleton in its fin, a cartilaginous based skeleton, in addition to having uh, dermal rays, a different kind of skeleton uh, in its, in its um, fins. And the Sarcopterygii, uh, which are the lobe fin fish, which are now considered to include all of the tetrapods, animals like mice and rabbits and ourselves, they all, they all have galactin eights. And it turns out that um, the galactin eight in, in cartilaginous fish is in the same environment, in the same chromosomal environment, or very similar as the galactin eights in the tetrapods and the lobe fin fish. Okay. In the case of the ray fin fish, there's been a jump of galactin eight to a different chromosome. And that other chromosome doesn't have a galactin eight in tetrapods or in cartilaginous fish. So there was a jump of galactin-8. And remember, galactin-8 is the inhibitory galactin. It's the one that um, interacts with galactin-1 to restrict its, um, its spread. Now, in addition, if we just consider these lobe fin fish, the lobe fin fish have acquired a non- a conserved non-coding module that is not present in cartilaginous or ray fin fish. And um, it's very, very um, uh, highly um, marked in, um, in all of the um, tetrapods and in uh, coelacanth, but it's not present in any of the um, non, uh, you can look at these numbers, these are high numbers and these are very low numbers indicating that they're not, it's not detectable here and it's highly detectable here. And the non-coding module contains binding sites from mice one, a transcription factor, several other transcription factors. All are mesenchymally expressed during limb development and mice one and runks two regulate proximal distal patterning. So this putative control element in front of galactin-8 is a novelty of organisms like us that have true limbs. Um, uh, the fins of uh, the galactin-8 in the, in the fins or anywhere in, in cartilaginous fish or in ray fin fish do not have this um, galactin, uh, this um, putative regulatory region. So now the galactin-8 is brought under control just in organisms that have true limbs. Okay, so conclusion of this is the galactin-8 gene, which arose in basal chordates, underwent a translocation around the origin of the ray fin fishes. Galactin-8 protein, now here we apply these um, computational methods to the, um, to the predicted protein structure of these proteins. And we found that the ones in cartilaginous and lobe fin fish evolved 3D structures that were similar to that of skeletogenic galactin-1. And remember, these, these um, proteins only take their role in this reaction diffusion adhesion mechanism, only take their role if they are able to compete with galactin-1 for its binding site on the cells so that they can inhibit the galactin-1's ability to clump or, or aggregate the cells. Ray-fin fish, galactin-8s, 
generally did not evolve to compete with their skeletogenic galactin-1 homologs. Okay, so the galactin-8 that jumped to the other chromosome did not evolve in the same way as the galactin-8s that stayed behind in the original site. The galactin-8 genes of lobe fin fishes, including tetrapods, acquired a novel conserved non-coding module that enabled them to be quantitatively regulated in developing appendages. Okay, so to, just to reiterate in the, um, in sharks, cartilaginous fish, and in tetrapods, the galactin-8 stayed on the original chromosome and developed at the protein level the ability to compete with galactin-1 a, or the skeletogenic galactin-1, whereas the ones that jumped to a new chromosome kind of went their own way. They underwent uh, apparently positive selection that was different in different species. Okay, so let's revisit this again. So the reaction diffusion adhesion mechanism for condensation pattern formation, we have the cell-cell adhesion term. and um, that, and we have the, um, and there is, um, in this term, there is um, a, a parameter, um, a, the, the beta that um, is involved in um, the binding uh, and the unbinding. Here we have the, uh, a term that has a, uh, a parameter mu that is involved in the um, uh, ability of galactin-8 to be regulated um, quantitatively. Okay. Now, now we look at this um, heat map and here is the galactin-8 expression rate mu and here's the galactin-8 binding affinity, beta. Here are the kinds of patterns that form. And you can see that um, in most places on this two-dimensional um, space, we get either zero or very few elements. But if we want to get a lot of elements, you have to be under the curve here. And um, there is um, a kind of sweet spot over here where you get the largest number of elements if you have intermediate binding affinity of um, galactin-8. You don't want it to permanently bind to its receptor because then galactin-1 can't aggregate the cells. But you also don't want it to bind too weakly to its receptor because if so, it can't compete with galactin-8. And then here, if you modulate the quantitative expression of galactin-8, you can go from um, a small number to a large number of, um, of, of elements. Okay, this is the number of elements here. And the lower amount of expression you have, the um, higher the number of elements you get. Okay. So how can we relate that to the different kinds of um, organisms? So let's look at the conclusion here. For galactin-8 proteins of intermediate binding affinity to their shared receptor specified by mu, the entire numerical range of parallel skeletal elements is possible. Different levels of galactin-8 expression, which is governed by beta, lead to different numbers of skeletal elements. Only in sarcopterygians, the lobe fin fish, including tetrapods, has there evolved appropriate mu values and control of beta. To, and then remember, beta is controlled by that um, non-coding, conserved non-coding module that has those binding sites for transcription factors to enable proximal distal increase in element number during development. So if we look at the different kinds of finned and limbed 
um, uh, vertebrates, we have the cartilaginous fish, which have a lot of parallel elements, very many parallel elements, and some plates that can be interpreted if you look at their development as many, many elements that have just fused together. And if we go back here, where in a region of the state space that has many elements, it's up here, okay? And it's uh, this part of the curve where the, you have uh, these, these colors, okay? In the case of actinopterygians, um, the, um, the ray fin fish, you have a whole range of different kinds of morphology. And remember, I mentioned that in these organisms, galactin-8 has not, in general, acquired the shape that allows it to compete uh, adequately uh, with galactin-1 so as to form regular patterns. So you have a, a kind of um, non-standard patterns. It's not the same in every fish. Some, you have some repeats, you have some, um, uh, some regions that are not repeating and so on. In the case of the sarcopterygians, you have this, this is non-tetrapods like coelacanth, and here are tetrapods. This is a, a shark, this is a human, this is a chicken. You have um, increasing numbers of elements as you move away from the body. Okay, you don't have just um, a kind of um, plate and uh, lots of elements, but you have an increase. It's in the case of um, fossil um, non-tetrapod sarcopterygians, you see some indication that this is happening. And in all of the extant sarcopterygians, you see one element followed by two elements or in many, most cases, um, of, of the land ones, at least you have the possibility of regulation of the number as you move proximal distally. And um, we suggest that this corresponds to the ability to control the amount of galactin-8. So you get well-organized repeating patterns when you have a galactin-8 that can compete with galactin-1a, but only when you have quantitative regulation during development, which is afforded by the, um, the non-coding um, transcription factor binding domain, which is a novelty in all of these forms, um, do you find that you can control the proximal distal progression? Okay, now I'm going to wind up in a few minutes, but i point out that there's ectoderm in the limb bud, and there's something called the apical ectodermal ridge, and this is a source of FGF8, fibroblast growth factor 8. And when we look back at the expression of galactins, and we add fibroblast growth factor 8, which is produced by the tip of the limb, the ectodermal tip, we suppress both galactin 1A expression and galactin 8 expression. So basically, as the limb grows out, at the very tip, there is a suppression of just those components that are involved in pattern formation. And the tissue has to move away from the tip in order to undergo pattern formation. And here is a simulation that's based on um, a reaction diffusion system in which there is production of a suppression, a suppressing um, component at the very tip. So let's look at what happens. Nothing. Um, okay. So 
as the tissue is moving away from the suppressive region, it forms a condensation. Okay, but the um, the width of that suppressive region um, changes, and you get transition transitions to larger and larger numbers of elements as you move out. So you can actually, based on um, a reaction diffusion dynamics that is suppressed at the tip so that it doesn't differentiate all at once. And if you just control the ratio of the activator and inhibitor and change the shape of the, the domain, you can actually generate a limb-like structure. Okay. Now, at the same time as this galactin model was being um, was, was being formulated and experimentally tested, um, there was another model called the BMP SOX9 WIND model, the BSW model by um, James Sharp and his colleagues. They had some experimental evidence for it as well, plus some simulations that these components were interacting with each other. Now, SOX9 is a transcription factor that is um, essential for chondrogenesis. Um, BMP is a morphogen, as is WENT. None of these components cause cells to aggregate. So um, our view is that this is um, a kind of a cooperating um, system that encourages the um, mesenchyme to differentiate into cartilage once the cells are permitted to aggregate. So we suggest that these, um, this network works in coordination with the galactin network. And then if we look at the evolution, um, because we know when these different components kind of came into um, existence, in the history of the limbed and finned organisms. Um, here we have skeletogenic galactin-1, BMP, and SOX9. They're all active here. Okay. At two, we have competing galactin-8 and galactin-1 and galactin-8 cross-regulation. And this enables the formation of the characteristic pattern of the cartilaginous fish, because we can get many parallel elements from the dynamics of the system that's defined by number two. But then we get to number three, we get galactin eight jumping to a different chromosome and we get positive selection on it. It's no longer competing with galactin one and we get variations in the um, in the um, endoskeleton, in the cartilage-based skeleton of these um, uh, ray-finned fish. It's, it's not, not stereotypical in the sense that this is or the um, Starcopterygians are. At four, we get purifying selection on galactin-8, making it increasingly competitive with galactin-1a and we get the galactin-8 conserved non-coding module. And then this allows us to have proximal distal development in the limbs. In, in coelacanth, this is tiktaalik, a, fo a fossil um, form that was the, the first um, tetrapod type of limb that's been identified. It has this format in birds, in um, amphibians and reptiles and in mammals. Okay, so basically this is the state of where we are now. We think that we know the um, relation between the evolution of these galactin components and ancillary components like um, SOX9, WINT and BMP, how they cooperate together to form these um, cooperating networks to give us um, skeletal structures. And then we have the regulation of galactin-8, which allows proximodistal development of the limb, particularly when 
uh, the tip is being suppressed by the fibroblast growth factor produced by the apical ectodermal ridge. So I'll just end there and um, thank my collaborators. And Ram Raybot was more than a collaborator on this. He basically initiated large parts of this whole project. Tillman Glim has done um, the mathematical modeling um, uh, in collaboration with us and um, uh, other colleagues of ours, um, uh, Hans Joachim Gabias supplied us with all of the galactin related reagents that we used in our experiments. And um, other collaborators were involved in the computational and um, anatomical analysis. And I'll stop there. Questions? Stuart, I have a question. Yes. The BMP SOX wind model that you described later. Uh, yes. Somehow you said it uh, was probably cooperating or acting together with the one that Ram Rai and you proposed. Right. But it seems to me that it could also be thought of as a redundant add-on. Could you comment on that? Sure. Um, so first of all, it, unlike the galactin mechanism, which we find um, is involved at all positions in, in the limb, not only in the digits, but in the more proximal regions, it organizes the condensations. The, um, the BSW mechanism um, is not doesn't seem to be as active in the more proximal regions. It seems to be a digit related module. So it may reinforce the digits, but it doesn't seem to be active in the proximal regions. Similarly, the um, BSW mechanism um, has been detected in shark embryos, but um, again, it's, um, it's just involved in a series of nodules that are at the very tip of the limb. And if you go deeper into the more proximal regions of the limb, uh, even the, ray, the rays, the cartilaginous rays that are attached to those nodules, um, the, that mechanism doesn't seem to be as, um, uh, as well um, regulated in that, in that domain. So we think that the BSW mechanism was acquired um, kind of coordinately with the galactin mechanism, but was mainly involved in distal organization. And um, interestingly, um, since you need SOX9 to form cartilage, um, and, and there's evidence that the rays, the dermal rays in, um, in the ray fin fish may be um, uh, also uh, coordinated by this galactin mechanism, you have this option of whether you're going to form um, what's called dermal bone or whether you're going to form cartilaginous bone, bone that's templated from cartilage. And the SOX9 seems to be involved in the cartilaginous um, choice, whereas RUNX2 seems to be involved in the direct um, differentiation of bone. So um, that BSW network may be a, a kind of a differentiation promoting network rather than um, an intrinsically pattern forming network. Uh, Mike. Stuart, could you stop sharing your uh, screen so we can see you? Oh, okay. Um. Uh, so my question is, what about polydactyly? So what happens in individuals with polydactyly? Yes, um, let me just see if I can get this back up again. Sorry about this. Um. I'm 
Am I visible at all to you? Maybe we can carry on nonetheless. Yeah. Okay. There's a question. Sorry about that. Yes. So, um, in a, in a Turing type of mechanism, in a Turing type of mechanism, um, the number of elements that you get, as I, I showed with the shark and with um, uh, ma mainly the shark, you see the, all, all those many elements in parallel. Um, it depends on the um, amount of tissue that you have to organize. So you have a, a, a repeating pattern and the repeating pattern, um, the, the distance between the elements um, tends to be constant and similar to the width of the elements. So if you have a big broad fin, you get many, many parallel elements. Whereas if you have a narrower piece of tissue, you get fewer elements. And, um, and in the case of like the, let's look at the human or the mouse limb, there's um, an expansion at the tip. So you have five digits um, that form, but at the prox proximal regions, you have one um, humerus called the stylopod and two um, uh, intermediate elements called the zoogopod. So the number of elements that you get or is dependent on um, the amount of tissue. So in some mutations, like something called talpid or the glee um, three mutation in, um, in mouse, you have a big broadening of the um, digital plate and you get many elements. So in the glee three knockout of mouse, you um, glee three is a suppressor of sonic hedgehog and it causes a great broadening of the limb bud, and you can have 10 digits, uh, up to 10 digits in the um, GLEE 3 mutation. In the chicken talpid 3 mutation, you can also get 8 to 10 digits because you get a big, great expansion of the limb bud. But there's also another aspect of, uh, that addresses your question. It was shown by the by Sharp's group that um, the Hox A 11 to 13 and D11 to 13 transcription factors modulate the wavelength of the um, Turing mechanism. So you can actually get thinner or thicker elements and, and um, in the same amount of tissue. So you can get fewer or greater numbers of elements in a fixed amount of tissue if you have mutations in these Hox proteins. On? Okay. Um, in your differential equations that allow the cells to aggregate, how yes. do you, like, I saw that there was a change in density over time, but like, yes. then how do you, like, relative to what? Like, if the cells are stationary, I understand how things would move, but if the cells are moving, like, how do you position them? Does that make sense? Right. So, yeah, it does. Yeah. So the cells are initially um, um, not touching each other. They're embedded in a in a gel-like matrix, and um, as you start the dynamics, um, you get foci of um, elevated galactin one, and those foci attract the cells. The cells move up the gradient of the galactin one so that um, in any given um, area or, or volume, there is a greater number of cells than there is in the surrounding region. And then the cells are then producing more galactin one and the galactin one is causing the cells to produce galactin one receptor. So you get a, a kind of a auto-regulation of enhanced condensation in those regions. And then correspondingly, you're getting galactin-8 produced, which drifts away from those sites of um, condensation and prevents the galactin-1 from acting on the cells when it's at, it's at high enough levels until, it, um, until you get far enough from those peaks of galactin-8, and then you can start up the galactin one um, foci again, but there's a kind of a 
um, a self-enhancing uh, aspect to um, the, the movement of the cells. I, uh, I got that. I meant how do you parameterize it in the differ differ differential, in the ODE model? Like how oh. do you just have like okay. uh, the, f like a a in any given area you divide up the space and then the densities change or something like this? Oh, oh I, so how is it actually implemented? So yeah, it's, um, um, th there's a, there's a module that was developed by, um, I think the paper is Armstrong, um, and it's basically the cells locomote up the gradient, upper gradient. So, um, so basically there is, um, um, if, if any point is occupied by a cell and the cell has a, an area, um, the, 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 the um, representation of cell material at any point in the grid will change over time, depending on the density of um, of the galactin one. That, that's the best I can explain it, but it's a um, it, it's an integral term. Yeah, I There are no more questions. I would like to thank Dr. Newman for the wonderful talk on behalf of everyone here. Thank you. Thank you.